So now we're going to look at a more theoretical problem or a more general problem of proving a cool fact about the GCD. There's lots of conjectures you can make about GCDs based on experimenting with integers. And some of them you can show that they're really true um, in earlier chapters. But there's other facts about the GCD that are real that you can't really prove until you understand the connection between GCDs and linear Diophantine equations. And in particular, Euclid's lemma is the, the really, really big tool here. So let me remind people what Euclid's lemma says. Um, it says that if uh, D divides the product of two integers and, oops, just kidding, there we go. Divides not absolute value, my bad. Uh, if D divides the product of two integers and it's relatively prime to one of them, then D has to divide the other. And I keep doing, I keep um, pressing control when I mean shift. Okay. Now, this is one of the many things that if you're familiar with unique prime factorization of integers, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, then this can seem somewhat obvious, or maybe not, but it, that's a great justification of it if you know the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. We don't yet know that, and the key to proving that is Euclid's lemma. So you don't really want to think, oh, I'm going to prove this using the fundamental theorem, because that would be very, very circular. Um, it's very hard to prove the fundamental theorem without this exact fact. Now, this has lots of consequences for um, interesting facts about GCDs. I'll remind you how to prove this. I'm not going to show you the proof because it's well done in the book. It's from the characterization of the GCD that makes sense in this chapter, which is it's the smallest linear combination of those two numbers, smallest positive linear combination. And that's a very different idea of the GCD from the definition. Okay, so let's do this using Euclid's lemma. Okay, the letters are a little different. Um, but let's see. So we're, we're going to assume that uh, we have some number d and that it divides a and that it divides uh, b times c. Okay, so one way to show the GCD, and this is the traditional understanding of the GCD, to, to show that GCD is 1, we just need to show that d equals 1. Okay, but that's the only number that could satisfy that. Okay, and we but we want to set this up so that we can use Euclid's lemma because that's really the right way to do this. Okay, so well, let's see. Um, we have these GCD facts, but they don't mention this new number d coming in yet. Okay, um, and so what we want to show, let's see, we have d dividing the product. Okay, so we have this part of Euclid's lemma, but then we need to show that d is relatively prime to one of the factors. So for example, b. Okay. So to set up Euclid's lemma, we need to show that the GCD of d and b, for example, is equal to 1. Now that's not very hard. Um, for me, I think it makes sense to show it as a little proof by contradiction. Okay. So assume that um, the GCD of d and b, uh, let's say, let's have one more letter, let's say e, and let's say that's greater than 1, okay? And I want to show that that can quickly go to a contradiction, okay? So what does that mean? We know that e divides d, okay? Um, so that means e divides a, right? Because here's um, the other part of the assumption. This is the part that we're not going to directly use in the when we actually use Euclid's lemma as our main tool. But one of the things that we're assuming is that D is a divisor of A as well as being a divisor of B times C. Okay, so if D and B have some interesting GCD, some common factor, then since A is assumed to be multiple of D, that's gonna that common factor is gonna be a common factor of A. Okay, but we're also assuming that E, oops, E divides B. Oh wait a minute. Okay, that all implies that E divides the GCD of AB. Okay. Um, but wait a minute. The GCD of A and B was supposed to be 1. Okay. So, in fact, that E has to be 1. In other words, D and B really have to be relatively prime. Okay. Now, we could apply the same argument to D and C, but we don't really need to, because Euclid's lemma, the way it's phrased, is a little bit asymmetrical. 
it, uh, <clears throat> it focuses on one of these numbers. Let's say we know D and M interact in a certain way, then it forces D to interact with N in a, different, in a certain way. So I'm just going to let that be asymmetrical. Okay, so now we can apply Euclid's lemma, and, and it's just going to finish off the problem pretty much. Okay, we know <clears throat> excuse me, that D divides BC. That was our assumption that D is going to be some factor of BC, and the whole point is that D can't be interesting. We want to show that it actually has to be 1. Okay, we know that D divides BC, and we've just shown that, in fact, the GCD of D and B is equal to 1. Okay, and so D has to divide C. Okay. All right, so now what have we got? Okay, now we've got, so D uh, divides A. We already knew that from a long time ago. We know that D divides C. Aha! So in fact, D has to be 1. That's where we finally use, we've got to use this somewhere, but that's where we finally use the, the GCD of A and C has got to be 1 as well. Okay, so there's our proof. Let's think about it for a sec, though, not to make the video too long. Um, it's this this uh, this is not this is getting to be a more advanced level. There's a lot of places you could go with this information, um, and the I think my big hint here is that when you get to interesting things about the GCD um, and how it interacts with multiplication and things like that, you pretty much you really want to go for this. You really want to think how can that be fit into this? How can this tool be applied? Um, and this hopefully was a pretty clear thing of like okay. This is a pretty easy, uh, a pretty standard setup for proving a GCD, something about a GCD. Assume that you have a common factor and then show something about the common factor, namely here, show that it's equal to 1. That set up, set up half of Euclid's lemma. Um, and then I think the trickier part is to figuring out, okay, exactly how does this set up the other assumption of Euclid's lemma? But that is a bit more standard stuff with GCDs. Then, once we had that, really the pieces start to fall into place. Okay.